Good evening. Welcome to another update from uh, Health and Human Services on COVID-19. I'm Eric Sergieko, the County Health Officer. And I'm Siobhan Katari, the Director of Health and Human Services for Mariposa County and the Director of the Department Operations Center. And so today's been a, a lot of activity, um, but I'm going to start, sort of go back to last week um, and talk a little bit about our cluster. And as you know, there's now 15 cases that are associated with Mariposa. Give you a little bit of details on that. Then we'll talk about um, what we've learned from the governor and from Dr. Angel um, over the last four days. Lots of moving parts. Um, still things, a lot of things we're still not uh, completely clear on. And so I'll start this evening by saying, bear with us. We're just sorting through the details. We got off a call um, with um, the deputy director of the California Department of Public Health. Lots of questions, lots of good exchange there, but still um, things that we need to have answered as we move forward into stage two and into what we're calling stage 2.5. But first, again, uh, as you know, we had our first um, Mariposa case in a Mariposa resident um, last Tuesday. Um, and since that time, we uh, had our contact tracing unit uh, identify a large uh, amount of people that were both cases, that is close contacts who became ill, and then we got confirmatory tests on them, and then a large number of people that were also contacts who have yet to develop symptoms. So we have already, from this cluster, had people go through their um, isolation period or their quarantine period. And so for clarification, isolation is for people that are sick and have symptoms. And in this case, they all tested positive. Um, their isolation period is in accordance with the CDC guidelines, which is 10 days from the onset of symptoms or three days after uh, their fever breaks, um, whichever is longer and with improving symptoms. So we've had several people come out of isolation We've also had one person come out of quarantine. That is a person who was in quarantine. That is a, a person who was exposed but didn't have symptoms. The quarantine period is actually potentially longer than the isolation period because quarantine can last up to 14 days. Um, and that's what we know is the longest incubation period, uh, most likely with COVID-19. About 97% of people will develop symptoms within 11 days of, of being infected with COVID-19. So the reason I lay this out is because over the last four days, we've had a lot of discussions or a lot of messaging with uh, both the governor's office and with the California Department of Public Health on moving on that roadmap um, towards you know, the new normal. And so the first step in that new normal is moving into stage two. And stage two is a limited opening and what we're going to do is we're going to throw up a quick slide here um, where we talk about moving from uh, 2 into 2.5 into 3. And so hopefully all of you are looking at this. And we'll go a little bit into detail on this because it's the only slide we have tonight. Is that stage 2, um, as we look at it initially, is only opening you know, in addition to the essential services that are already open, is retail curbside service only. And how the governor has portrayed that is, is that a business would uh, get a phone call or an internet order from uh, a customer, and then that customer would come up to the business and get the package and, and payment would happen and they'd go off. Um, but the other thing that we've talked about with the state this week is stage 2.5, which is regional variants. And this is actually what we kind of perceived some of the elements of region of stage two to be, um, but the regional variants is something we can apply for and that allows for full retail um, uh, offices to open where teleworking is not working for them and then restaurants for dine-in with appropriate social distancing. All three of these things do require um, social distancing and some uh, elements of uh, risk reduction. And then it's not until we get into stage three that we see more businesses open, specifically things like uh, personal care, which is salons, barbers, gyms, 
um, what are classified as high-risk business. And really what they're looking at for this is large gatherings that are less than 50. And then the other thing that we see in stage three, and this is important for us as Mariposa, is non-essential travel is permitted. And that allows us to open our short-term lodging. So again, in both two and 2.5, uh, non-essential travel remains uh, something to be avoided. And so uh, at that point in time, we should only be seeing people from Mariposa in all of these businesses. It's not until we get into stage three that we talk about opening everything up for, uh, for uh, visitors to come and spend some time with us. So that's kind of the stages we're going to be going through. Um, we're going to switch back to to picture here. So that we've had over the last four days is how rapidly we'll move through um, stage two into 2.5 into three. Um, the variance process requires us to have um, some capabilities in place before we apply for that variance. Um, the team today has been going through the template that we got probably about one o'clock this afternoon. Um, and we actually feel very comfortable in going forward to the board on Tuesday um, with that variance. And what we will need at that point is I need to sign off on a letter of attestation saying that we've met these five capability areas, which include um, the most challenging one for us right now is that we're, we have to have uh, less than one case uh, per 10,000 residents in the previous 14 days. And so we're going to have to count that clock out to Tuesday because of the cases we had last week based upon when they had onset of symptoms. Um, so that's the timeline we're working to go into variance. Um, but the other things we need to have in is we have to be sure of our surge capacity that our hospitals um, can manage. Uh, a surge of 35% or more in patients that they have appropriate PPE. We also have to have the ability to do what we did last week, which is contact tracing. We also have to be able to take care of our at-risk patients, and that's demonstrated by our ability to have enough PPE within our skilled nursing facility. And then finally, we need to have the ability to ramp things back up or put more mitigation measures in place. And so once we've signed off on that as an attestation, or once I have, then that goes in front of the board. Uh, they provide a letter of support. The other thing that we'll need as a package going to the state is a letter of support from John C. Fremont as our hospital where our surge capacity is at. The state this evening said it's really a submission process. There isn't a, an approval process at the state level. It's us putting out there in public that we have the capability to manage an outbreak in Mariposa, that we can take care of surge should that happen, um, and that we have our at-risk population taken care of. And I think on top of the things that we're being told to do in the attestation, um, we're layering other things on that. We recognize that about a quarter of our population has some form of either uh, medical condition or age that puts them in that risk category. So not only do we need to protect our skilled nursing facility population, we need to protect our other at-risk population. We also have to look at what we're doing with the park and make sure we're in sync with them. So we're doing a lot of planning, not only with the park, but with Madeira and Tuolumne counties. Um, so the other thing I have to say is um, I was a little bit disappointed in where we were going with stage two and 2.5 looking for some things that make more sense in stage three, but I ask everyone to bear with that. Um, we've uh, expressed our concerns, maybe a little bit more than just expressing our concerns um, to the state, and we're hoping for some feedback that's positive on that. So I'm gonna stop for now. I don't know, Siobhan, other thoughts that you have before? No, I just, I'll questions. just add um, one of those capacities uh, that we spoke about was testing and we've talked to you about that before and we have ramped up our testing capacity here in Mariposa County. We now have a test site in partnership with um, OptumServe, which is something that the state sent in because they've identified us as a testing desert. And so we're just going to encourage folks to go to our website and to get go get tested if you want to do that. 
Um, the more people we can test, the more surveillance we'll have on the community and what's happening here in terms of the spread of COVID. And um, it is available to you. It's free. Um, you just sign up online or through phone. Um, you can find that on our social media sites and on our county website at mariposacounty.org. And as always, you can call our COVID helpline as well, which I'll give you the number at the end. And it, testing is is relatively fast. Uh, I went up there on Tuesday, um, was there for about 10 minutes. Um, and for me, I would say it's not painful, but not pleasant either. Um, but it's a brief tickle in your nose. And as long as you bear with that, again, it's the PCR testing. It's not serology. I think I mentioned that earlier is that the serology test may be coming later. And we're looking forward to that to happening. And then the other thing is, is that we're we're looking and see if we can actually take this on the, not necessarily on the road, um, but we know that there's a large population of seasonal employees that will be coming into the park um, when the park opens. And so the idea we may be able to uh, take it on the road there and do a week up in Yosemite testing that, knowing there are um, people coming from all over the country to work here um, and want to, again, protect our population. We protect our population best by knowing what's going on, not only in us as residents, but people who come here. Um, so that's pretty much all we have. There's a lot of questions still out there on um, not necessarily the businesses that will open, but whether we've got some negotiation space there, and then how rapidly we can move into stage three. Uh, I would say as a minimum, we're looking at one incubation period I think that's what we want to look for is how much changes in that one week period, or correction, that one incubation period. So that two week period starting tomorrow. Um, and then the state will look at that and see what we're doing. And I think the thing we really want to just stress is that the community um, has done a really great job in helping us to manage this disease and prevent the spread so far. And we really need to continue that. Uh, the message we want to give is that just because we're moving into phase 2.5 and ultimately phase 3 doesn't mean that we need to stop doing all of the really important things, the social distancing, the good hand hygiene. Um, and the staying home when we're sick and the protecting our vulnerable populations. It's really going to take a whole community approach. It's going to take us working together with our businesses. We want to make sure that we continue to meet all of the capacities and the indicators um, that we've been speaking of so that we don't have to um, toggle back as it's been described or, or start to put more restrictions on. We're looking forward to the ability to return to some type of normalcy, but we need everyone to work together in order to do that. Yeah, actually, we need to be more diligent, more aware of the risk for disease as things start to open up. Um, because it is that balance between restarting our economy, which we recognize, I recognize needs to happen but yet protecting not only our at-risk population, but everybody. And so everything from hand hygiene to staying home if you're sick, all those things that we started out talking about with this eight weeks ago still remain very true. Can open it up for questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my questions are starting to disappear because we're getting so many. So I'm going to try to remember what I read as the first question. Um, if short-term vacation rentals are going to open soon how do we get uh, how do we keep outsiders out, out of our community so um we don't um but what we'll do is it, as the um criteria for stage three is met stage three is that trigger to allow non-essential travel um we know from previous recessions we don't know from previous pandemics but we know from previous recessions that the visitation to the park um, changes. It's no longer international travels, travelers as it is travelers from the Bay Area and more from within California, sort of that staycation. So uh, the advantage of that is that we will know that population. We have really good disease surveillance that's statewide. And so we can kind of assess what the risk is there. I also suspect that even if we have people doing staycations, we're going to have people that um, don't travel even this far from the, you know, travel here from the Bay Area. People will stay very close to home. 
Um, so the question is, is how do we balance that risk? And it goes back to what we were saying is that you've got to do those personal protective measures. And we as the county, we as a community need to protect our at-risk folks. So it gets back to doing more testing, um, heightened surveillance, doing our febrile respiratory screening. And businesses have put really great measures in place already, curbside pickup, delivery, those types of strategies that we're hoping can continue um, because we feel like as we do get higher, a higher number of visitors in the county, which we're likely to do, some of us may choose to do takeout versus eat in. Some of us may choose to do some of that pay, that pickup and, and use those services alternatively. So we are encouraging businesses and working alongside them to keep those strategies going. And the last thing I'll throw out for this question, but it may come up again, is that one thing the state has done really well at is, and Siobhan's got a copy on her, in front of her, is they've produced uh, 18 sectors worth of guidance um, for things from uh, ag to manufacturing, to lodging. So they've really put in some very good detail for all of those business sectors and how that those business sectors can mitigate or eliminate risk um, for the people that are in that environment. Okay, next question is from Natalie Granda from ABC 30. She'd like to know, is Mariposa County ready to move further in stage two based on the new guidelines set for the counties by the state? Is it even possible for Mariposa County based on being considered a testing desert? So yes, we're no longer a testing desert. So that's, that uh, is a, a great asset to have the OptumServe site here. At its maximum, it can do 132 tests, or collect 132 tests a day. And that is probably about eight times the number of people we need to test to eliminate being even a minimal uh, testing desert. And so that was a huge uh, victory for us. Um, the other concerns I have, well, contact tracing, as we saw with our outbreak last week, we uh, responded to that well. Search capacity is actually one of the first things that we've worked with. Um, I think really the question is, I don't have any problems with 2 or 2.5 um, because we know that people will still be doing their level best to limit their non-essential travel. Um, it's The concern is, is when we move into stage 3. And so by the time we move into there, that's where we need to have those uh, businesses doing their febrile respiratory screening, letting us know if they have a large number of uh, people with symptoms, continue that testing, continue working with the hospital to identify any early outbreaks. All right, and also we will be posting the link on Facebook for the business sector, so we'll do that after this is yeah. over. Um, it's actually, I would say that that was one of the challenges we were having on the phone call we just got off of was finding the links for all the documents, mm -hmm. and we're still digging around in there and finding things. Next question's from John. Can retail clothing stores put sale racks outside tomorrow? Yes, so what we understand is that tomorrow the uh, state executive order and uh, county or state health officer's order will be amended. We understand that's gonna come out about noon, but we do, uh, as of tomorrow, is when we as a state will move into phase two. And what that means well, okay, so let me amend my yes in the beginning. So what phase two will mean is retailers can start to do curbside pickup. What uh, Dr. Sergianko referred to as happening next week is after an attestation is brought before the Board of Supervisors on Tuesday, um, what that will mean is at sometime after Tuesday, should the board approve it and should everything go as planned, then retailers will be able to open using the guidelines that are being put forth by the state. One of the things that we're gonna do next week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're gonna host a series of Zoom meetings for retailers, for restaurant owners, and for um, other offices to help you with the guidance for anyone who has questions. But once again, that, that guidance website will be posted. It's covid19.ca.gov backslash roadmap. And all of the business guidance is there. So if you want to take a look for your business, you can certainly do that. All right. Next question is from Terry. How long will each stage take? 
So we don't know. I think that's probably the most, the question we have struggled with the most is how long will each stage take? So it says a minimum, um, we know, it will, well, we don't even know. I am guessing that the, the minimum length between stage two and stage three will be 14 days. That's one incubation period. But we may go two incubation periods, which is 28 days. If we see a change in what the disease is doing, that is we see a large ramp up in cases, then we may have to apply some of the um, strategies that we used in stage one, reapply those in stage two, so sort of take a step backwards. And that's why, again, we're, we're being really cautious in moving forward with this curbside service first for a couple of days for one weekend. And then I think, you know, that's good for us. We'll be able to meet as a board with the public um, on Tuesday, talk about that, and then, you know, sort of take the next step for the next weekend and then see where we're at for stage three. You know, what we learned from the governor on Monday, which was different from what we had thought the week previous, was our thought was is that we would be able to move forward either as a county or as a region from stage two to stage three. But what we got from the governor um, on his press conference on Monday is that we'll move forward to stage two as a group, that's tomorrow, then 2.5, that variation, um, will occur at the county's own desire or as it's doing its own attestation. Um, and then stage three, it sounds like at this point, is moving forward as a state again. Though I, just like we were talking about what businesses could be open in various stages, I think the state's thinking that out as well as could we move forward as a region uh, at different times. So stand by for that. Um, again, I ask for your patience because it's the first pandemic we've all been through, and and, and so things are things are, are we're learning it. So hang in there. All right. Next question is from Lori. Why isn't everyone wearing a mask? Can we set up portable wash tubs to wash our hands around town? So I'll take the first. The, the second question first is I think that's a great idea. Um, to set up hand washing stations because hand hygiene is is very important. It's actually probably more important than masks and because I've gotten a lot of questions about masks via email, um, I think it's, I've got a long version um, about mask wearing and um, that's a little bit longer than just a sound bite and I've seen a lot of the back and forth on Mariposa chat um, and that you get that sort of back and forth because there really isn't a clear answer. Um, and I've said it's fuzzy before. Fuzzy to me means that there really isn't science out there that supports it. Um, we do know that by wearing a single layer like a bandana, you reduce the viral transmission by about 4%. If you wear a four-ply mask like uh, I've been wearing around town, that reduces transmission by about 20 to 40%. But we also know that uh, in a very small study in China that a mask wearer, either with a cloth mask or with a surgical mask, was actually able to cough hard enough to shoot viral particles into a viral culture and cause that virus to grow. So a mask is only partially protective, so it's risk reduction, but um, there's also some harm associated with it. So we know from a really good study that was done by an Australian professor working with healthcare workers in Vietnam that someone wearing a surgical mask had a reduced number of uh, uh, respiratory illnesses. But if someone was wearing a cloth mask, they actually had an increased amount of respiratory illnesses over someone who was doing standard practice. Now, standard practice could include wearing a surgical mask or it could just include good hand hygiene. And then when this professor, uh, Dr. McIntyre, did some sub-analysis, she found that it still held true if you were wearing a surgical mask protective, uh, wearing cloth mask, not so protective. But what we know is that the reason we're wearing a mask is not to protect you, but to help you protect the community. So what that means to me is I think most of us could be wearing a mask to reduce the transmission of particles, um, virus to other people. But the concern I have and the reason I don't make it mandatory is because if you're wearing the mask 
and you inoculate yourself, you can get infected. So we know that's an increased risk. And then what if you happen to be one of those people that have an underlying medical condition or are older than average, and that puts you at risk of serious disease? So you know, that's the concern I have, and I want people to be aware that really um, wearing a mask for someone of Siobhan or my age is probably okay as long as we don't have an underlying medical condition. It probably will reduce the disease transmission, but there are reasons that people have not to wear a mask because it may put them at risk because they have an underlying medical condition or they're older than average. So sorry for the long answer, but that keeps coming up. Um, and one of these days I'll put out a really long answer that has all the references. All right, great. Um, next question, uh, will tourists be tested in order to enter Mariposa County? Um, I'm going to say no, uh, but what I would really like and what we've been talking with OptumServe about is right now they are limited to testing Californians, but I think it'd be a fantastic idea if they could test at least a, a sample of the visitors to the park. The other thing I will say that's a cool thing that we're doing is I can say the word poop, um, and we are going to be starting testing um, wastewater from treatment plants in El Portel, MPUD, uh, and Wawona, and maybe I think Lake Don Pedro. And um, that will allow us to do sort of a pooled sample of uh, people and see if they've got virus in, um, in their wastewater. Okay, thank you. Um, also, I just want to mention that because we're getting so many questions, a lot of them are disappearing if we haven't asked them yet. So if I, if you think I skipped your question, please um, ask it again. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, so the next question is um, from Edith. Um, do you have any say in shutting down bus services in Yosemite? Not actually in the park itself. So the park is exclusive jurisdiction. Um, but I will say that that is something that they're considering. And they have their own environmental health team, uh, George Carroll. But he also has um, uh, resources um, in the National Park Service, uh, both working out of the regional office, out of Denver, and out of Washington, uh, that are providing guidance. So we've been in coordination with the park. That has been one of their considerations is within the park itself is limiting the shuttle buses there. The other thing that they've been considering is, again, large tour groups because they're already looking at, you know, a gathering or a large group of 50 uh, may be restrictive. So that's things that they're considering. But I, beyond that, I, I don't have that many details. And on the state website, there is new guidance for public transit. And so as such, public transit will have to adhere to certain standards, which may change the, the travel patterns in the park as well. All right, next question is from Sandra. Oh, it went away. I think I just lost it. Ah, yep, um, it was something about, will um, local parks be able to open soon? So interestingly, they put uh, parks in phase three. And I think the goal of putting parks in phase three was um, you know, to, to limit the large gatherings that occurred. But there is some other guidance that talks about outdoor recreation. And so that's an area that's a little bit gray for us, I right. think. Well, and yeah, so under even right now in stage one, outdoor recreation is allowed. And so where we've sort of defined that as if it's an outdoor recreation, an activity where you can maintain social distancing, where you can stay in your own bubble, that that's an okay thing. Um, but by the same token, if it's a large gathering, um, then we want to stay away from that. So uh, I'd, I'd say the difference between a, a wilderness area and a central park. Um, and we're somewhere in between with our local parks here or like the Stockton uh, Preserve. Totally fine to go up there, go trail running, uh, even go up there with a the family as long as you're staying in your own family bubble. As long as you can go to the park and socially distance and practice good hand hygiene and all of that, then we're calling it allowable. All right, next question is from Kimberly. Um, will the 4th of July event continue? 
I'm a little unclear on which 4th of July event, uh, Kimberly, that you're talking about. I do understand that um, the Butterfly Festival is hoping to do something around the 4th of July, maybe the Taste of Mariposa. Um, once again, until we move into phase three as a state, which could be you know, as, as early as late May, early June, um, we won't be able to do large gatherings. Um, in phase three, um, some larger gatherings will be able to take place. However, probably not gatherings over 50 or large events or venues. And so it really depends for events that are coming up um, how they structure themselves. And um, we have been getting some questions from different events to see if they can go forward and operate. And once, uh, once we get some more phase three guidance for how to safely do that, we'll ensure that the community gets that as well. Right, it's not until we get into stage four that we actually are able to um, basically go back to normal yeah, where we can large have ones. large gatherings of about 50 people. All right, next question is from Tallulah. When does the stay at home order get removed? So it doesn't get completely removed until we get out of stage three into stage four. What happens tomorrow is it becomes modified. Everything becomes modified uh, incrementally between where we're at now in stage one, stage two tomorrow is that curbside retail where, again, the intent is to limit uh, non-essential travel. I think that's one of the, the phrase changes is we're avoiding right now. Basically, you should not do non-essential travel. And then tomorrow it's kind of limited, and then it sort of broadens up as we go into three, where you're again can now do non-essential travel, but can, should consider whether it's it's worth doing or not. Uh, it's not until we get four where we say, okay, we're back to normal, and we don't need to worry about uh, doing that risk assessment uh, on whether to do travel that's non-essential. All right. Next question is from Karen. Why? Um, it was about um, getting the notification for testing. Why did um, why did she get a notification for cases fourteen and fifteen like she did the others? So fourteen and fifteen were um, cases associated with Mariposa residents who actually were taken care of outside of the county. Unfortunately, um, one of the cases was a. A woman who was in a rehabilitation facility in um, uh, Stanislaus County um, and uh, her husband and so the the reason we didn't do as much notification here is because we already knew the risk to the community was essentially zero um, because the infection occurred in a long-term care facility out of our county and the infection to the husband happened also outside of the county <laughs> Next question is from Tracy. When will we start testing for antibodies? So right now, um, if you have a provider who's willing, um, Quest Diagnostics has an IgG uh, serology test available. But I think last time I was on, I talked a little bit about serology, um, but I can talk about it again, is that knowing the prevalence in our community is low, that means the percentage of people that have been infected is low, is that the likelihood of um, having a false positive um, is about the same as having a true positive. And so if you get a test and it's positive, I can't tell you as a clinician whether it's a real one or not. Um, and until we get better testing for serology, it helps me as a public health practitioner um, figure out sort of population prevalence, how frequent it is in the population, but it doesn't help you as a patient figure out whether you were infected or not. All right, next question is from Terry. Channel 47 is reporting 15 cases and 12 recovered. Is this true? So I'm going to say Christina's nodding at me, so we've got 12 people out of So I, I missed the epi call, at, uh, the contact tracing unit call to see who was released today, but I knew it was a big number. And there's a, little, a smaller number yesterday, so yes. So we're waiting for those two other people before we go forward with with our board item next week. 
Uh, okay, next question is from Penny. Can the park open very slowly and limit the numbers? Yes, they can. Um, that's part of our discussions with the park and part of the discussions that the park's having with their uh, regional office in, in Washington is, you know, we already know that the park will look different in terms of visitation from previous years. We just don't know at this point how that's going to roll out. Um, that's just like we're putting our plans together um, and working with the state they are putting their plans together and working with their regional and uh, Washington offices. So some things we know a lot about, other things we don't have real good detail on, and that's okay. Um, but we do know that visitation this year will look different than previous years. All right, next question is from Edith. I'm concerned about travel over Tioga Pass. How is Mono County doing? So uh, I talked with Tom Boo this morning. Tom is the health officer for Mono County. Um, they're as concerned about us as we are about them. Um, so they had one case in the last week. Um, so their activity is actually lower, um, but they do have an element of community transmission that we don't. Um, so we're staying in close contact with them and actually one of their uh, county supervisors joined our area coordination team meeting yesterday and we're gonna be bringing them on board for closer coordination so that when Tioga Pass does open, we've got a good understanding of disease transmission on both sides of the Sierra. All right, next question is from Leslie. When do you see us reaching stage four? Do you think the Mariposa Fair will be able to happen, asking before all of our local kids buy livestock? Yeah, so really good question that I don't have a really good answer for. Um, I've mentioned before, I don't think that we'll be in stage four until we get a vaccine. And I think the earliest we'll have a vaccine is January. Um, so the likelihood of us having a fair uh, like it normally happens, I think is pretty darn close to zero. That said, um, with things like FFA, could we do it in smaller groups, gatherings of less than 50? Could we look at a different fair that builds around smaller groups with that work. So that's something I don't have a really good answer to because I do feel comfortable saying that we have a high likelihood of being in stage three uh, come the fair. Um, so is there things that the kids can do um, around livestock, around their projects that would be in a smaller group? So uh, homework for people other than me. All right, next question is from Olga. How about massages? Can I get back to doing them? So Olga, I, I really wish you could, um, but that is a stage three activity. Um, and so looking at least at that two week period from today until the first look for stage three. Um, and again, we're going back and forth with CDPH to see, you know, from our equation, we're just saying, how do we mitigate risk um, rather than a, this kind of low risk versus high risk activity. It's not whether it's low or high, it's what are the measures you can put into place to mitigate those risks. And they're really considering um, stage three activities to be those that would require you to be in close contact with someone that's closer than a six foot distance for more than 10 minutes and something like massage or hair salons or nails or those types of personal care. Uh, activities uh, do put people at risk still and so until phase three it doesn't look likely that that will happen all right next question so once we are all the way open what happens when there is a de development of multiple cases do we close again so the idea will be in, um, we're going to be sharing our, some of our plan parts out is that we'll have what are called indications and warnings so we'll be actively tracking um, things like febrile respiratory illness, labs, um, and we'll be able to layer on some of the things. So rather than go from stage four all the way back to stage one, we'll do things where we go from stage four to stage three or stage three to stage two and back and forth layering on um, those closures or those disease modification things so that we don't have to go all the way back to stage one where we're at right now because we know how impactful that is. That said, if we have, um, I think that's something we need to be prepared for, not necessarily over the summer and the fall, but if we have a bad flu season, 
and uh, COVID-19 comes back at a, a high level of activity, we may be back where we are right now. All right, next question is from Susan. What is your best advice for folks over 70 who have faithfully done the stay in place as things change around here? Are we to stay, are we still to stay in place or go out and get some acquired immunity? So I'm gonna say, I'll start by saying a 70 year old, um, you know, that's an at risk population. Um, even if you don't have any underlying uh, medical conditions. So we encourage during stage two to continue that stay at home activity through stage two and into stage three. Um, and Siobhan, I think, would want to talk a little bit about those things that we're doing for our community to allow people to stay in place. Yeah, so uh, if somebody is continuing to stay in place but needs food or supplies or anything delivered to them, we certainly want to make sure that you, you can do that. And so by calling our COVID helpline at 259-1332, we can make sure that um, you have what you need to be able to stay in place. That being said, we also want to encourage people to get exercise, get outside, those types of things, but really limit your bubble. I know if, you, if you're on social media, you may have seen um, some information come out about who's in your bubble, and we really encourage you to, you know, um, interact with those people who are close-knit uh, in your bubble, but try to minimize that to the extent possible. So whatever we can do as an agency, as a county, to support you, we're here for you. All right, and um, Jenny would like to say, Eric and Siobhan, you're both fabulous and doing an amazing job, and we appreciate you. No, you're doing an amazing job. <laughs> All right, next question is from Natalie Granda with ABC 30. When does Mariposa County plan to send a letter to the state to allow county officials to take the lead in the reopening process? So, um, as you know, as we mentioned earlier, what we will be doing is going to the board on, so we move, we'll be moving as a state to phase two tomorrow. We'll be going to the board next Tuesday. That'll be something that the County Board of Supervisors, along with Eric, can attest to the fact that we're ready to move to stage 2.5, and then the state will make the decision about when we move to phase three. I hope that answered that question. Next question is from Kathy. In January, February, so many people were sick. Could it be we had the virus then? So that gets back to the serology question. Um, so what we know about the, the whole genomic sequence, the, the string together of the RNA of the virus, um, is it was very, I've heard, you know, sort of, could it have been here in November, December? And the answer to that, I think, is based on what we know about the gene sequence is no. Um, and by the epidemiology of the disease. Could it have been here in February? Maybe. I think it's less likely based upon the severity of disease we've seen in people in the Bay Area, in Los Angeles, in New York. And we had people that were sick. 10% um, of the hospital uh, staff had some sort of febrile illness. Um, but I will say of that staff, we tested a couple people for coronavirus at that point, and they were negative. Um, so that's kind of, um, I think, a, again, less likely, but not zero. Um, so serology may help us sort that out. But again, given the lack of severe disease that we've seen with uh, COVID-19 and the fact that we were able to uh, test, kind of, uh, test a couple of the staff um, that, and they were negative, that uh, it's less likely. All right, next question is from Tallulah. Is it okay to go over to someone's house if it's not a big group of people? So that's kind of the risk decision we ask everybody to make is, you know, you keep your bubble, um, your, your personal bubble, your work bubble, um, and you know who is in that, you know what uh, diseases they have because they're the same microbiome as you. I get to use that word every once in a while. Um, but then when you introduce your bubble to someone else's bubble, uh, there's that risk that they've been in touch with someone else's bubble. And so consider who you're meeting with, where they've been, what they're doing, um, and if it's you feel at risk versus benefit uh, is beneficial to you, then make that decision. 
but also, again, the basics still apply. Maintain a social distance, good hand hygiene, covering your cough and staying away from them if they appear ill. And the one I always forget, don't touch your, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, because that's the way you inoculate yourself. And consider using the test site. So that might be one thing as we move forward. And, and now that we do have new testing capacity, as you want to expand your bubble and maybe families start to hang out together, consider all getting tested. And if you're all negative and as Eric suggested, you're not going out to different bubbles all, all the time and back and forth. That might be a, another family, another individual you can start to hang out with. We want to make sure we decrease social isolation as much as possible. We know this has been really challenging for folks and, and to the extent that you can socialize in a safe way, we want you to be able to do that. But all of those guidelines that Eric talked about are really important. And I agree, testing is an awesome uh, capability that we have here. So take advantage of that um, because it really is uh, we, what we've seen again over the last couple of days is we can do 132 people, but we've had about 100, uh, a little more than 100 each day. So there's plenty of room. Come mm -hmm. come on down to the alternate school and get, get your nose swabbed. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Sandra. Will youth sports, including high school, be able to be played this fall? It's possible that youth sports will be able to play the, be played this fall. Large, large gatherings, large sports events, certain sports may not be able to be played until uh, phase four, um, which could be a while. But they are looking at what types of sporting activities may be allowable within the phase three. And, and we are hopeful that we will be in phase three by the fall. And if we're lucky enough or if the disease transmission is low enough, and I'm, I'm answering this because high school was mentioned and we've gotten questions about this, is graduation. Mm -hmm. um, it's an important thing for those kids. It's important for their family. Um, we've been talking with the school district. If we're in stage three, what are those things that we can do with the smaller uh, in-person, 50-person or less gatherings um, so that we can have a graduation experience? Okay, next question is from Cindy. Some propaganda is saying our current directives are actually compromising our immune systems. Please advise. So, you know, where this stems from is that uh, herd immunity is if we get enough of, us, of, enough of us infected, we'll stop the transmission of disease. And for herd immunity to occur, we have to have about 50 as a minimum to more likely 70% of people infected. And what we know with the number of confirmed cases and deaths we've had, based on the few seroprevalence studies that we've got, that really in New York probably saw about 15% of the population infected. In the Bay Area, about 4% infected, a little bit larger in LA. Even with those imperfect, imperfect studies, we know there was a heavy, significant toll associated with that. So that's the, the risk versus benefit that we talk about, is if we allow us all to get infected, there will be a, a significant number of people that will get harmed by this. We want to avoid that as much as possible. All right, next question is from Jenna. Oakhurst hairdressers can be approved individually to be cleared to open. Is Mariposa doing something like this? So I think that may have been what was alluded to uh, by one of the questions earlier is um, uh, Madeira County is following, uh, going a little bit ahead of what the state is doing. And they're looking at implementing some of the stage three guidance while we're still in stage two. Um, we don't know the repercussions of that for um, businesses that are licensed by the state. That's our larger concern is we wanna keep our businesses intact and so if you are a state regulated, like a cosmetologist or a place that is regulated by ABC, um, we don't want to see you come in harm's way by opening too soon. Um, I do know that uh, Madeira is opening up businesses, uh, but again, they're doing that ahead of what the state would like them to do. And we do know that some, or I think most salons have gotten a letter from the state licensing, their state licensing board, indicating that they shouldn't open ahead of when the state's ready to have them open. So once again, we don't want to put our businesses at risk um, by having you lose licenses. It's really important for us. 
yeah, we want people to open. We want them to be doing the right thing. But if you do it too early, um, we don't want to lose that economic generator. All right, there's a few questions about schools. So there's one that kind of covers it all. I'm going to skip to that one, and then I'll go back to your others if I if you think I skipped you. Um, what do you expect school will look like come the fall? Will the kids be able to return? Will it be partial distance learning, partial on-site? So I think that gets back to one of the questions we had last time we were on Facebook Live is we really need to bring Jeff up mm -hmm. for Facebook Live. Um, so stand by to stand by on that. What I will say is um, school will look different. There probably will be some elements of partial distance learning, some elements of in-person learning because we know, especially with the career technical education stuff, that that needs to be hands-on. Um, but it, how classes look in the fall will be different than they were in fall of 2019, but how it looks different, I just don't know yet. Um, <laughs> what can we do to volunteer to help seniors? Yeah, that's a really good question. We are actually launching what we're calling a neighbor to neighbor campaign. So if you're part of a service club or a church, you may have already gotten this communication from us. We will also be putting information out on Facebook Live. What we're really encouraging folks to do is to reach out to people who are seniors who may be isolated, uh, reach out to them by phone, make sure that they're uh, having some ongoing contact. It is it is lonely when you live alone and when you don't have someone to talk to every day. And we want to ensure that they have as much contact as possible. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has also been recruiting volunteers to help with things like grocery delivery or supply delivery. And so to the extent that you want to do something like that, I'd encourage you to reach out to the Chamber of Commerce. Um, but once again, to the extent that you can just reach out to those around you that you know, maybe pull out your old phone list and start to contact people, that's really important, giving them information about um, how they can access services if that's what they need, or just touching bases with them can go a really long way. All right, next question's from Katie. Will campgrounds be open separate from more formal lodging like hotels, or are they stage three as well? So um, for the National Park and the National Forests, um, my understanding is they'll probably align, well, the parks I know for sure will align with stage three, not as clear with the forests. Um, because again, that falls into that gray area of outdoor recreation. Um, so as an example, uh, the Merced Irrigation District is opening camping to locals only within the same rules that they opened up for boating for locals only. Um, they, because again, outdoor recreation is not so much about uh, not doing it, but maintaining your bubble and staying in an area where you kind of know the risk and not bringing in your risks from other communities. All right, so next question is from Rachel. You said that we won't be able to be in stage four till there's a vaccine. Will vaccines be mandatory for certain jobs? Um, I don't know. Um, you know. If we use flu as an example, um, we do have a requirement or uh, that healthcare workers get an influenza shot annually or uh, alternatively wear a mask. Um, so that may be the way we go with that. That's the only mandatory uh, occupation for us here in Mariposa County. Uh, is healthcare workers get a vaccine, the flu vaccine every year, and I can see the same model for a COVID-19 vaccine. Next question from Edith. I'm curious about getting transportation from Yosemite to the test site. Will the drivers be able to come into the park to pick up someone for testing? Yeah, so a couple of things with that is we are working alongside uh, Yosemite. One of the things is Yosemite already does collect test specimens at the clinic, at the Yosemite clinic. So if somebody is symptomatic and needs to get tested, please call the Yosemite clinic. If you want to be tested at the OptumServe site, um, what we will do, we're trying to get testing up in the park one week a month, looking for a whole week that we can get up there. We're, we're working on that, more to come on that soon. But if you do need a ride and you want to get to our OptumServe site, you'll call 966-2000 and we can come into the park and we can pick you up and bring you for a test. 
Okay. Uh, next question from Karen. As a contracting business with public contact at clients' homes, should we be tested and how often? We've begun this process, but unclear if, she, if we should repeat. So for our healthcare workers um, and for our public safety folks, we encourage them to do it every two weeks. Again, that ties back to the incubation period. And so if you're doing a lot of contact with at-risk populations, um, I would follow that same recommendation. The nice thing again is we're, we started this out eight weeks ago and we were screaming to get testing capability. Right now we've got a lot, and so take advantage of that, get tested every two weeks. And then uh, again, if you if we, we, if we swing serology at some point in time into the process, get your uh, blood check for uh, serology as well. Next question from Stephen. What is the probability of building an immunity contracting COVID now in the hotter days as opposed to waiting for the second wave in this next winter? So the question comes down to does COVID-19 behave like influenza? And what we knew with the H1N1 pandemic back in 2009 is that the uh, infectivity rate dropped significantly during the hotter months and there weren't a whole lot of people getting infected. So even the likelihood of getting infected is lower and we still have the risk of getting a severe case. And then the real question mark is uh, do we build a prolonged immunity after exposure in, in the summer? So if you get infected in the summer, we still have immunity in the winter time. All right, and this will be our last question. Um, and just a reminder, if I missed your question, I'm sorry, our team will get back to you. Um, this comes from Josh. If you come in contact with an infected person and you also become infected, how many days will it take until a COVID-19 test would test positive? Okay, so um, if you're symptomatic, you'll likely have a positive test. Um, and what we know is that you can, you can develop uh, enough virus in your nose or in your throat to be test worthy about two days after exposure. You're most likely to be at the highest amount at five to six days post exposure. Um, but that can go out for several weeks where you're still able to recover RNA um, from the nose. And so uh, test early. Um, and generally what we're doing with our, our contacts is we'll try and test them two days after their last exposure, uh, or two days after their first known exposure, nine days after their last exposure, just to make sure that they're clear. Okay, great. All right, thanks so, so thank much. you. And I just wanted to end by saying 259 1332 is our COVID helpline. So, if you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.